Investors. The following is a presentation of TFNN. The Tom O'Brien Show is produced every business day. Tom takes your phone calls toll-free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. Let's go to our man, Al in Homo Sasa. What's going on, brother? It, isn't it wonderful? I went ahead and invested in your uh, Tiger Dollars, <laughs> and I went ahead and got the gold report <laughs> for a year, and, and also your, morning, your, your call letter and stuff like that. That and I got over a fifty percent return in one day, not counting uh, everything else. But I just want to thank you. Tom's not perfect, but he tells you how to put your stops in, and he keeps your losses small. You can take your small losses, but then all of a sudden you'll be like Dave Root, and you'll hit a home run. I mean, a big home run. Yeah. And put the money in your pocket. Okay, I mean, brother. I You're awesome, man. Thank you. Now, Tom O'Brien. <laughs> What's going on, folks? This is Jacob uh, filling in for Tom. All right, let's let's look what's going on. We kind of have like a sideways market rocking here. Um, DIA only up a little bit. NDX up not even a percent. SPY up half a percent. Um, it's moving sideways. The dollar is um, staying pretty stable, but still at that 102 area. Gold is popping. That's definitely the big player of the recent times. Let's look at. Um, I want to take a look at Steel Dynamics because last time I was on. Uh, we were looking at this retest of the last day with volume. And so it did reject it, but not with a lot of volume itself. So that's yet to be seen what kind of pans out with this. We can take a look into Nucor and see how that's shaken out as well. Again, a little bit of upward movement with light volume. I still think looking into the steels uh, and the, just the metal sector in general is, uh, it could be profitable. Um, all right, let's take a look. So there is a relatively new treasury bond ETF, T-bill. Now this has a weird structure, um, which helps fund managers kind of offload some uh, taxes that they have. But what's important, what's interesting about this is we were speaking last time uh, about the flight out of banks into money market funds and kind of flowing into to treasury bills as well. Um, so what's interesting about this ETF itself is um, in the uh, something in the in a single day. That's right, on Tuesday, um, registered inflows of 582 million dollars, and that's according to Bloomberg. Uh, that pushed the fund's asset under management of 1.15 billion. So that's I mean almost double. It's interesting to see this kind of flight in here. Uh, banks still are obviously having some issues. Your regional ones are still having a lot of problems. Uh, Poor FRC, and I, you know, again, I was saying there's some people who took the buy right around here, thinking that was going to bump up, and it just kept going down. And I'm not sure how much gas it has left to go down. I mean, you have a lot of volume going on this, um, but you know, any kind of you know, bump in the foreseeable future to to a point that matters, unless you bought at the bottom, probably isn't going to happen. Um, there's some other weird stuff going on in the banks today. Um, let's see. The French uh, actually raided five of their banks in a Paris tax fraud case. So um, the raids come as part of five preliminary investigations opened in December of 2021 on allegations of money laundering and tax fraud linked to dividend payments, the French National Financial Prosecutor's Office said in a statement. Um, so we're not sure what the kind of outcome of this raid is yet, but their five large banks um, really uh, are getting looked at. So that's HSBC, PNB, Paribas, Exane, uh, Societal General, and then Natixis Bank. Um, we'll go a little bit more into, so when I was, you know, this popped up and I was, I was curious, you know, how much of this is really going on, especially with such a, the money, monetary supply is contracting now, obviously, but we had such a large explosion and so how much um, essentially fraud is going around, and I found this study that was released recently by the National um, Institute of Economic Research, excuse me, National Bureau 
of economic research, and that goes a little bit into uh, tax dodging. Um, it's pretty insightful. Uh, let's see here. As far as other smaller news, Toyota executive expects average new car prices to exceed 50000 in 2023. So I, again, with these labored supply chains, we're going to keep seeing this happen. And um, I mean, like, what can you say, right? I, I just helped um, one of my friends uh, get the get their self a car. Um, they had to buy a used car. Um, the, the prices are just insane. And cash flow is a serious problem for a lot of Americans. So you end up having to do like long term loans, you know, six years, seven years on um, used vehicles, right? These newer vehicles going to 50,000 is gonna be a, a massive issue and we're probably gonna see um, maybe a little bit more inflation with, with used vehicles because of that. Um, it says in this article in February, average new car prices reached a new peak, jumping by 4.8% uh, from years ago to 46,229. That's according to JD Power. Uh, Toyota's North American division uh, <clears throat> head of sales, Jack Hollis, said that he believes the average transaction price will crest the 50,000 mark in 2023. I don't know, guys. It's not, it's not phenomenal, especially at a time where we might see some more major layoffs and uh, kind of contraction in wage growth. What else do we have? Let's see. Ford is, <laughs> again, same within this line, Ford is hiking the prices of its F-150 Lightning. Uh, we were kind of speaking a little bit um, on some of their issues rolling out electric vehicles last time I was on. Um, excuse me. Uh, but so, yeah, they had a battery fire in February, and that kind of halted some production. I think they're back up again. Um, this is nuts. So Ford said that the standard range Lightning Pro, okay, a lower cost version of the truck optimized for fleet use. Here, let's see if I can pull up. Um, let's get this guy up. All right, so they said that their standard range Lightning Pro, lower cost version of the truck optimized for fleet use, will now start at just under 60,000, and that's not including shipping. I spoke about this guy, oh man, a few months ago, saying it was really cool they were getting in uh, to this market. Um, but that's, that price is roughly 50% higher than the Lightning Pro's original start price at launch last spring. How you miss that is pretty insane to me. I, I would love to get kind of a little bit more insight. I, I don't know if they were just kind of, you know, you have so much nowadays where you kind of just, you, you um, it's the hype around the product, right? You announce it, you say we're going to do it here, and the consumer gets so hooked on it, the idea of, of, of having something like this. And this happens in video games. It happens with, you know, it happened with Tesla, um, and these prices just keep, hiking up. So the starting price for the Lightning in the top of the line Platinum Edition, okay, um, is now almost a hundred grand for a pickup truck. I don't know who's buying that. It, it, I don't know what, I mean, this is going to have some kind of serious impact on their bottom line in the future. I, I mean, there's no way, <sighs> uh, who knows, maybe people will buy this. It, it, you're going to have to wait to see, I suppose. But in, in my opinion, this is going to, this is pretty prohibitive for a lot of people. Um, when we get back, uh, we'll look a little bit uh, into what China's doing. They, ha they have a lot of interesting things going on regarding uh, their BRICS arrangements and kind of their Belt and Road Initiative and how they are positioning themselves in the world regarding energy uh, and all that. So folks, stay tuned and we'll be right back. Currencies, commodities, and bond markets are as important as ever right now with how they're driving the volatility in equity markets across the globe, which is why it's a great time to try out Teddy Kegstat's Tiger Forex Report. Teddy Kegstat breaks down the Forex markets every Monday using his 30 plus years of experience as a trading veteran of futures, Forex, stocks, and options. Teddy releases his weekly Tiger Forex Report every Monday morning with coverage of all the major currency pairs, including the dollar index, the euro dollar, pound dollar, dollar Swiss, dollar yen as well as many more and he also has weekly coverage of the crude oil market and the 30-year t-bonds as they both influence forex markets tremendously when you sign up for the tiger forex report you also gain instant access to teddy's 60-minute webinar archive he just hosted forex strategies and fundamentals what is behind the tiger forex report for all the details and to start your 30-day tiger forex report subscription today visit the front page of tfnn.com tfnn educating investors 
Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Call now, toll free at 1-877-927-6648. Internationally at 727-873-7618. All right. Um, before we hop into the whole China discussion, I thought this was really interesting. So it says the EU looks at investing frozen Russian assets to raise cash for the Ukraine. Um, you know, another thing I'll touch on later is kind of looking at some of the defense stocks and everything, and a lot of everything's priced in. The way that these kind of programs work is, um, at least on the U.S. side, um, all of the uh, technology, the equipment, the uh, weapons that we're uh, giving to the Ukrainians is done on a loan, essentially, right? These aren't like donations. Ukraine is going to owe uh, the West quite a bit of money after this, this war is done, right? On top of that, um, their infrastructure is completely leveled. This is an interesting idea by the European Commission. Um, so it says, estimates potential investment returns uh, of around 2.6% to help fund the post-war reconstruction. Um, yeah, and this was interesting to me because, I mean, it sounds like, you know, something that they, they probably would have done in the past, but I suppose that it is relatively unprecedented according to Politico. Um, and it it's interesting because we're at a time, and, and you'll see this with what we'll talk about regarding China and BRICS, but um, we see a... a huge schism now occurring between, you know, Eurasia into the Eastern world and between the West as well. Um, and this kind of act in a way does reinforce that, right? So, I mean, obviously they're punishing just Russia for this, but the idea then can be, you know, if you're like a wealthy businessman um, or a company or whatever um, operating outside of the West and excuse me, if you're headquartered outside of the West and you're operating within the West, um, that this could be done to you in the event that your government does something, even if you don't agree with it, right? This is a risk, of course, that occurs um, in, in uh, global economics. Uh, but it is, it's quite interesting. Um, so it says the commission document, which is set to be discussed by national experts meeting on Tuesday, explains the legal grounds for investing Russian assets. I'm super interested to read what this is. Um, in addition to as well as associated risks and gives estimates of possible investment returns. Um, given Russia's invasion of the Ukraine uh, amounts to a, quote, exceptional and gross violation of international and humanitarian law, the commission believes that it could ground its case for investing Russian central bank assets 
and reaping returns to the benefits of Ukraine and international law. And it'll be interesting to see again what they use that for regarding the Ukraine. Is it going to be for that debt payback? Is it going to be um, done as some kind of relief fund? Um, again, I think this is kind of like a novel concept that they're doing here. Um, and just beyond any kind of, you know, judgments on it, it'll just be interesting to see kind of how this plays out. Uh, the EU thinks that around two thirds of the 300 billion of Russian central bank reserves frozen in G7 countries, the EU and Australia are currently held in the block, including 191 euros, uh, excuse me, 191 billion euros in Belgium, 21 billion in other unnamed EU countries. Uh, it doesn't know fully yet where Russian central bank reserves are held and included an obligation to report on the whereabouts in its latest sanction package against Russia to try to get a clearer picture. And this is really you're seeing now that the world, of course, has gone through, you know, massive globalization periods throughout history uh, with different empires. But the way that it is so intimately connected now uh, because of things like technology um, and the way that it moves so quickly, uh, this is laying groundwork for kind of, um, you know, essentially protocols if this occurs in the future. I do think, too, though, in a way, is this, this really does solidify that uh, divide that exists between the West and the East and the East, um, especially with rising stars like China um, and India, for sure, uh, in, a, in ways can stand on its own in uh, ways it hadn't prior. Um, I was reading a Goldman Sachs article, and I, I could not locate it, but it, one of the, uh, he was an ex-analyst for them, and he was saying that the, the reign of, of the U.S. dollar is close to being over. Well, if, if you look at the world reserve currency for the U.S. dollar, it's, it's not really decreasing. It has probably about 2%, which is equal to the ratio which the uh, Chinese yuan or the renminbi uh, was adopted. But um, the, the, the point being, though, is that the East is making moves on the rest of the world um, in its own kind of block uh, while the West is having to deal with this kind of stuff, um, which is only going to drive it further. Um, so, you know, it'll be interesting to see kind of how this plays out. Um, let's see here. Cash Carry uh, says there's more work to do regarding uh, inflation. And this is, uh, people are now warming up finally. I've, I've seen more people talk about it. Um, which is that the, the rates might not go up anymore, um, but they are gonna rely on these banks to get dried up quite a bit. And it, it'll be interesting to see what happens. The FDIC wants banks to, uh, the big banks basically to take uh, kind of the onus of what they had to do with, um, with Silicon Valley and, and Signature and kind of refill the FDIC coffers. Um, this does kind of cut in to a bottom line quite a bit. I, I know in 2009, when the FDIC had uh, JP Morgan pay some to cover the insurance, um, they lost something like 690 million, 685 million, I think, um, which was cut into their, their second quarter bottom line. But rates are so high right now uh, that when you're gonna get that inevitable flow of cash back into larger banks, once this kind of settles a little bit more, um, it might not be a massive problem, but I, I think what's important is what happens in the meantime with that. And I do think that um, we are going to see much more issues with banks. It says uh, the Federal Reserve has more work to do to get inflation back down to its 2% goal. Uh, and Cash Carey said this. Uh, he's the Minneapolis Fed president, in case anyone did not know that. Um, although he did not say specifically how much further he believes interest rates will need to rise to do the job. He says, we've seen some real progress, but that, that should not in the trader's mind say, okay, we've seen some real progress. Things are going to go back uh, to how they were before this. It's like, no, you know, inflation is still up. Um, some of these, these key metrics that they're looking to determine the health of the economy um, are still not being fully suppressed. They might have been halted regarding their, their growth, um, but uh, they're, they're not being, um, there's no, I suppose, reduction in that. Um, and so that kind of suggests that this, this tightening is going uh, to, to continue, uh, whether that's done by the Federal Reserve or whether that is kind of um, achieved through some of the limited actions that banks 
um, are going to have here. Um, Cash, Car uh, Cash Carry said, uh, town hall event, uh, noting that housing market has slowed, the goods prices have fallen a bit, and new leases are less expensive. Uh, he says the one area that is particularly concerning right now is uh, the service economy. It's outside of housing. It has not shown any sign of slowing down. He said wage growth is still growing faster than what is consistent with our 2% inflation target. Uh, he goes, that tells him that we still have more work to do. So right there. Um, it's interesting. I know the 2% is, is the goal to hit, but I mean, we're still at 4.7 to, to, you know, 5%. I don't know. We'll see what happens with this. Uh, guys, stay tuned. Um, we'll get back to what I said we were going to talk about <laughs> the last break. So uh, stay tuned. If you want to take advantage of this sector, now is the time to subscribe to my gold report. The gold report is a comprehensive look at the metal sector as well as the markets that move gold, which is the currency and bond markets. New subscribers get a 30-day money-back guarantee, so you have nothing to lose. Every Monday morning, I publish the gold report with coverage of gold, silver, bonds, the XAU, HUI, GDX, as well as more than 30 different mining equities. To see for yourself the types of profitable trades that are recommended within the Gold Report, sign up now by visiting TFNN.com. Don't miss out on the next great gold trade. Sign up today. Sharpening your skills as an investor is like getting better at playing a musical instrument. You have to practice, sure, but you also need excellent instruction from experts. At TFNN, you'll get advice and guidance from the authority in technical market analysis. And it's not just dry, tedious text either. TFNN airs live financial content streamed live on TFNN.com and TFNN's YouTube channel with Tiger TV. Live every market day from 8.30 a.m. to 4 p.m. Eastern. For free, each host is an experienced trader and gives their take on the market while taking calls and questions live from around the world. From the moment the market opens until the closing bell sounds, Tiger TV has eight different shows with expert hosts to help you make the right moves with your money. Watch online at TFNN.com or on TFNN's YouTube channel and become the investor you were born to be. TFNN, educating investors. TFNN has just launched their new trading room, The Tiger's Den. Hosted at Discord, TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. And now they are expanding their reach with The Tiger's Den. Available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. In The Tiger's Den, you can look over the shoulders of Tom O'Brien and the other TFNN hosts while they analyze charts during their live Tiger TV programs and join an interactive trading community with hundreds of members exchanging ideas. Interact with other Tigers and Tigresses as they share trading ideas, news analysis, and discuss the market action all trading day, even at night and on the weekends. The Tiger's Den at Discord is accessible on mobile or tablets as well, so it's always at your reach. To sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders, just visit the front page of TFN. TFNN.com. This segment is brought to you by Think or Swim. For more information, just click the Think or Swim banner on the front page of TFNN.com. All right, let's talk a little bit about BRICS and this new deal between China and Brazil. Um, so they have agreed to trade uh, in their own currencies. Um, so China and Brazil have reached a deal to trade in their own currencies, ditching the U.S. dollar as an intermediary. Brazilian government said Wednesday, and then Beijing's latest salvo against the, quote, almighty greenback. Uh, the deal will enable China to top rival U.S. economic hegemony and Brazil, the biggest economy in Latin America, to conduct their massive trade and financial transactions directly, exchanging yuan for reals uh, and vice versa, uh, instead of going through the dollar. They say the expectation is that this will reduce costs, promote even greater bilateral trade, and facilitate investment. Um, China is Brazil's greatest trading partner, uh, with a record $150 billion in bilateral trade last year. Um, the deal, which follows a preliminary agreement in January, was announced after high-level China and Brazil business forum in Beijing. 
The president of Brazil was originally scheduled to attend the forum as part of a high-profile China visit. Um, the Industrial and Commercial Bank of China and the Bank of Communications, BBM, will execute the transaction. So this is pretty big, but, you know, there is a massive value to having kind of a standardized, like, currency or at least a standardized, like, mode of payment. A lot of times, you know, the U.S. dollar is the vehicle currency uh, for all trade. And a lot of times the debt is used, so bonds will be used or, you know, whatever form of debt there is, in order to facilitate these transactions. And that's because you can kind of predict, at least, where the dollar is going to go, uh, so the transaction is kind of stable, at least, um, on that end. It'll be interesting to see, you know, what happens if the, you know, renminbi appreciates vastly and the real depreciates vastly, kind of what uh, essentially the amelioration for that will be. Um, Again, this has been done a lot of times. I just, I don't know what they're planning on doing in order to um, kind of curtail that possibility. Additionally, China um, has just done a deal with Saudi Aramco. Boosted inve Saudi boosted its investments in China with two refinery deals. Let's pull this over here. So, Saudi Aramco raised its billion dollar investment in China by finalizing and upgrading a planned joint venture in Northeast China and acquired, um, it was a 10% stake in um, uh, Zhejiang Petrochemical Corporation. Uh, let's see here. Um, Ramco said on Monday it agreed to a 10% stake. Uh, the deal includes 480,000 barrels per day of crude oil to Rongsheng um, uh, for 20 years. And it follows a preliminary agreement Ramco reached with Zhejiang province uh, excuse me, provincial government in 2018 for a 9% stake. Um, the deal, so this is the big, this is the big thing, and this is kind of what I was trying to get at a little bit with how dominant China is being. Um, you know, it, uh, in 20, I think 2020 or 2021, uh, the U.S. actually did broker uh, a deal between the Palestinians and the Israelis, um, excuse me, with Saudi Arabia and the Israelis, um, which had, you know, prior... Uh, been, you know, unthinkable. You know, if you went into a coma, you know, in 2019 or something like that, and woke up, and then you you learned something like that. I mean, it it was massive, right? That didn't get a lot of pressure from the media for whatever reason. Um, but what's happening now, uh, which is arguably um, equally as large, is this kind of deal that Iran and Saudi Arabia uh, just made to reestablish relations, and that was brokered by China. Um, this is huge. Uh, Iran is, um, you know, strong power that goes right into the uh, Caucasus region, the north. That's a good connect into Russia, into China itself. And Saudi Arabia, obviously, um, is quite an attractive business partner for anyone. And China's really been ramping up their uh, consumption of fuel. Um, additionally, they also, and this is kind of more of a smaller side note, um, but they just did a deal for uh, liquefied natural gas um, with, with France. Um, again, th that's pretty big. So, I mean, they, they are certainly inserting themselves as an entity um, that, that can, you know, play on the big stage. Um, additionally, you know, regarding this, um, uh, well, let's see here. So, and we'll, we'll get to Russia in a second regarding this. Uh, Russia unseated Saudi Arabia as China's top oil supplier in the first two months of this year. Um, Aramco is already selling crude to the East China plant, which operates at 800,000 bar uh, <laughs> barrels per day refinery, uh, the single largest in China, under the sales agreement renewed annually. Um, Russia had been uh, massive for, uh, excuse me, China was massive for Russia's uh, income regarding crude oil, especially during um, the, the sanctions that the West imposed. Um, and so, I mean, just last Tuesday, um, Nikolai uh, Shulganov, as the Russian energy mi minister, uh, the country has now been able to redirect all of its crude oil export, uh, exports that have been impacted by Western sanctions over the Ukraine. Um, and he called them friendly countries, the people he was selling it to. Um, he goes, I can say today that we have managed to completely redirect the entire volume of exports affected by the embargo. There is no decrease in sales. Uh, you know, who's to say that's the full truth behind it, but certainly um, countries uh, like India, I mean, India was buying a bunch from the Ural region, and China certainly um, is uh, in need of a lot of fossil fuel. Um, 
So there's no question that Russia's fellow members of increasingly influential BRICS alliance have played a major role in helping Putin uh, government achieve this outcome. Again, so this is the important thing here. India was the biggest buyer of Euros grade crude in March, accounting for almost 50% of all such exports. And again, this is like this this new thing that I'm talking about is like there there is you know th this way of soft power uh, and waging like an economic kind of conflict um, is going to become less and less effective um, the more that you have uh, other countries rising to the scene, such as such as China. Uh, in a separate story in early March, Reuters reported that China's seaborne imports of Russian crude were set to hit high records in March uh, based on ship tracking data. Uh, tanker tracking consultancies Vortexa and Kepler estimated nearly 430 million barrels of Russian crude oil um, uh, reached China in March, um, a number that would exceed previous high of 42.48. And Saudi Arabia's uh, economic entanglements in China continue to progress, um, obviously with this new story right here. Um, you know, it's interesting because we we have you know obviously these trade routes set up and if you look at i'm not going to pull up a map right now but if if you look at just a world map and you see the line from china to saudi arabia and then what comes next which is uh the african continent i mean this is what the belt and road initiative is i was in uh, serbia a few years ago and um there were a ton of uh, Chinese businessmen who were there. Um, they're trying to sell EVs, but furthermore, they're trying to further um, some solidification in, in trade. And this is this idea of, of hopscotching all the way down um, and creating basically what would be tantamount uh, to a new Silk Road regarding um, raw materials. Um, furthermore, you know, when you have, <laughs> when you're like a you know, the big lender like that, as China is, they're, they're investing in this kind of infrastructure. Um, you sometimes have issues. And we'll get back to this fully when we come back from the break, which we're going to go to here in a second. Um, but what happens when the countries that you've lent money to, because Chinese aren't doing this for free, just how the U.S. doesn't lend out things for free. Um, what happens when the countries that you're working with um, are in a financially sticky situation? And China is about to find this out, and we'll go into that a little more when we return. If you're looking for potential trading setups in the stock market, then Rocket Equities and Options Report is a newsletter you should try. Tommy O'Brien delivers options and equity trades when the markets present them using a combination of fundamentals and technicals. Sign up for Rocket Equities and Options Report today with a 30-day money-back guarantee so you have nothing to risk. For all the details and to start your subscription today, visit the front page of TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Biotech is booming, but for how long? Whether you think the biotech bull has room to run or has run its course, trade LABU or LABD. Direction's daily S&P Biotech three times bull and bear ETFs. Visit directioninvestments.com slash biotech today. 
An investor should consider the investment objectives, risks, charges, and expenses of the direction shares carefully before investing. The prospectus and summary prospectus contain this and other information about direction shares. To obtain a prospectus or summary prospectus, please contact direction shares at 866-476-7523. The prospectus or summary prospectus should be read carefully before investing. An investment in the funds is subject to risk, including the possible loss of principal. The funds are designed to be utilized only by sophisticated investors such as traders and active investors. Distributor for Side Fund Services, LLC. TFNN has launched the Tiger's Den, hosted at Discord. TFNN has been educating traders for more than 20 years with live programming hosted by a variety of professional traders during market hours. The Tiger's Den, available to all tigers and tigresses for just $1 for the year. There's no catch or added costs when you join our community of traders. Sign up today and become a part of this educational community of traders. Just visit the front page of TFNN.com. This program is brought to you by Vista Gold, traded on the NYSE American and TSX under the symbol VGZ. I'm O'Brien. All right. So yeah, let's just check this out quickly. Um, this is China's bilateral bailouts. Uh, it's total almost 240 billion. So the light blue is the direct balance of payments and support. So just straight up giving that cash. And this, the dark blue is a swap line facility, and that's from the uh, People's Bank of China. Um, it says rising global interest rates and strong appreciation of the dollar have raised concerns about the ability of developing countries to repay their creditors. Several sovereigns have run into distress with a lack of coordination among creditors blamed for prolonging some crises. Um, and again, this is where China can really step in and kind of what I, in a way, was hinting at regarding what could possibly happen trading in like similar currencies. Um, or excuse me, in the country's own currencies. Um, let's see. What's interesting is China is part of the International Monetary Fund, and they absolutely refused uh, to have any kind of multilateral bailout whatsoever. Um, and I mean, on you know, partnering up with the IMF to do this, this they're really solidifying. Like this is our deal. We don't need you guys in it whatsoever. Um, and they're, they're posturing themselves that way. Um, yeah. And you can check this out here, too. You, exactly what I was just saying with the IMF. Like, lending represents over 40% uh, of IMF lending in the three years of 2021. I, it'll be curious to see what happens. Obviously, the dollar is depreciating a little bit right now. And if we get a bank collapse, we'll, which I'm not saying will happen at all. But you'll have even further depreciation. Um, and we'll, that might lend up a little bit. Regardless, with the high rates, that will be kind of a consistent problem. Um, all right, what else is interesting? And I'm going to say it is what is going on again with uh, chat GPT and the letter that was just signed by some pretty big names. Um, obviously, chat GPT has just basically knocked everyone's socks off. People love it. Microsoft has come back as the dominant leader in tech after quite a few years of derision among um, its uh, competitors and people who even use it. Um, so what this is, what I'm going to pull over here, is uh, from an organization called The Future of Life. And what, what's interesting about this is, is the, the way, what has happened essentially um, is they're, they're making standards here, right, of like how should we look at uh, AI, what should it do, um, and then, you know, essentially saying we need to all work on this together, right? These are the questions. How can we make the future AI systems highly robust? Um, how can we grow our prosperity through automation while maintaining people's resources and purpose? How can we update our legal systems to be more fair and efficient, keep pace with AI? And this is massive, and this really is going to take, a, you know, a multinational and really a, a global kind of um, edge to it, and it, it needs to. Um, the last thing I feel like you really want to get into is if AI gets advanced enough, and I, and I mean it in the sense that it becomes advanced enough, but also prolific enough um, in every system we have that you end up getting uh, essentially power races with other countries. And that really could end things uh, pretty, pretty quickly, and I, just regarding like total global relations. And so it's nice to see these kind of policies popping up. 
Um, what happened a few days ago um, was the same company uh, released a letter basically calling, uh, again, saying we all need to work together on this, but calling for a pause for at least six months uh, regarding the training of AI systems more powerful than GPT-4. GPT-4 is, I think this has been hyped a little bit um, in the sense that like it is just like a, a language model. Um, it does get a lot of things wrong a lot of the times. Um, but I think if we look at this from kind of more like a psychological perspective, right? Like everyone's now talking about AGI um, with something that isn't even close to what AGI would be, and that's artificial general intelligence. Um, and so I think they're hopping on this uh, essentially to be like, okay, let's really get a game plan going um, and figure out how to pivot around there. Uh, but you had, I mean, let's look at this. These are all the signatories. So Nigo, director of Mila, the Turing Prize winner, and that's really, in a way, kind of what this almost, uh, this uh, principle kind of uh, is effective as, is kind of like an, you know, addition to some kind of like Turing uh, test. Um, so Russell, Berkeley professor, Elon Musk, Steve Wozniak, Andrew Yang, if you remember him, just a bunch of guys, uh, co-founders of Ripple Pinterest. So, I mean, this is, it's nice to actually see in like a world where nobody can, seem to agree with each other whatsoever um, that this is, uh, that this happened. We'll see what Microsoft does. Um, there was a cool podcast with the founder um, of ChatGPT with a, with a guy named um, Lex Friedman. Um, Lex Friedman uh, is a young guy, but he was instrumental in AI research. Um, it's a pretty cool podcast to check out. And the chat GPT CEO, you know, he's like a hype master and has been for a while. Um, but uh, he was a little bit more candid with what he really sees as like the limitations of chat GPT in its current um, manifestation. And, um, you know, I, which I think kind of would temper the outlook that a lot of people have. Um, let's see here. Some small interesting news as well. Uh, the Pentagon fails its fifth audit in a row. <laughs> uh, can't get its books straight. This was a good quote. Um, this is the DOD comptroller, so the accounting guy over there. He goes, I would not say that we flunked, uh, Mike McCord said, um, but he did admit that they could only account for 39% of the $3.5 trillion in assets. Um, that's pretty impressive. Uh, I don't know what you make out of that. Um, the Pentagon's... this. Something else with it. the Pentagon's most famous uh, recent, as this, this article states, the boondoggle is the F-35 program, which has gone over its original budget by $165 billion. But hey, listen, so many times in economic recessions, government spending gets you out of it if you want to look at World War II. So <laughs> maybe the, the Pentagon shoving through a bunch of money that they can't account for will somehow help us in the end. Uh, on that same kind of note, um, someone was asking, I was reading on a forum, um, why uh, defense stocks aren't going up. And the truth of the matter is that defense stocks are absolutely going up, or they, they have been at least. Um, give me a second. They might not have gone up in the recent year, but in the beginning of the war uh, in the Ukraine, these guys popped quite a bit. Okay. Some nice latency with that. And so, you know, beginning of the war, right around here, um, you see a nice pop up. All this stuff's priced in. Something that's interesting to look at, um, obviously, like on the American side, um, we're essentially giving some old uh, materials stuck in storage, right? Um, that kind of were just being depreciated on the books, and uh, we send those out. But in Europe, um, they're actually ramping up production uh, in a meaningful way. Um, so stocks like Rheinmetall and uh, Bay Systems, Bay Systems is UK, Rheinmetall is obviously a German company. Um, these guys have just skyrocketed um, in the past few years. And so if you're looking for exposure that way, I think like on the US end, we're kind of priced in. Even Lockheed Martin even came out with one of their newer, um, it's now like an unmanned uh, drone, but it goes extraordinarily fast and it can keep up with jets, uh, but nothing 
really was reflected because everyone was anticipating it. If you want to get more exposure in that, I would definitely recommend checking out, seeing what the Euros are doing regarding uh, defense, and that's Rhine Metal and Bayesian. You know, I'll put those in the den, but uh, we'll be right back, guys. Are you looking for a way to consistently add winning trades to your portfolio? Tom O'Brien is here to help. Tom O'Brien has been successfully trading markets for over 30 years. A frequent contributor to TD Ameritrade Network and CNBC, Tom O'Brien founded TFNN over 20 years ago to help educate investors just like you. Tom's daily market newsletter, Market Insights, is published every morning when the markets open to give you the competitive informational edge you need to succeed. These newsletters are packed full of Tom's advanced technical analysis and are geared to deliver comprehensive strategies for a successful portfolio. Get Tom O'Brien's newsletter, Market Insights, today and try all of our products and newsletters 30 days risk-free with our money-back guarantee at TFNN.com. TFNN, educating investors. You might think that if you want to be successful at trading in the stock market, you're going to need a crystal ball. After all, it's impossible to predict the future, right? Like any endeavor in life, before you decide it's impossible, get some advice from the experts. You might find that it's not so impossible after all. For daily market overviews that give you direction on the key indices, selective stocks, and commodities, subscribe to the opening call newsletter at TFNN.com. The opening call newsletter is written by Basil Chapman, creator of the trading methodology known as the Chapman Wave. The Chapman Wave up-down sequence gives you an edge in identifying price turns, finding the peaks and valleys in stock prices. Get the opening call newsletter by Basil Chapman in your inbox every day. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know, and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. TFNN.com, educating investors. Everything in the universe is governed by the Fibonacci sequence. This mathematical principle is responsible for everything from the most aesthetically pleasing artwork to patterns in the stock market. To stay on top of stock patterns you can take advantage of, sign up for the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter at TFNN.com. When you subscribe, you'll get a weekly report from veteran day trader Larry Pesavento on stocks you need to pay attention to. And you can trust Larry's analysis. After all, he's got 45 years experience as a day trader. Larry will also provide daily charts, videos, and data on the key markets that he's tracking. Expect notifications from Larry on market movement you need to act on at any time. First-time subscribers also get a 30-day money-back guarantee. If you're not satisfied, let us know and you'll get a full refund within 30 days of signing up. Subscribe to the Fibonacci 24-7 newsletter today. TFNN.com, educating investors. Don't forget, you can listen to TFNN live on your mobile device 24 hours per day. Go to TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. That's TFNN.com, then hit Watch Tiger TV. All right, folks, we got about two and a half minutes on this for the end of the show. Um, it, something interesting I read um, was the consumer sentiment is deteriorating in America and like how could it not be, right? But these are some of the points lined out. Um, so it says the US government is, and I had not actually heard about this at all. Um, it'll be interesting to see what happens with this kind of economic crunch we're gonna have here. Um, the US government plans to cut SNAP, which is the food stamp program, uh, welfare benefits starting in 2023. Um, you know, I don't know how this is gonna affect low income people and you get more people kind of out of work. And if at some point you do get kind of like a complete fallout of wages. This might be a, a major problem. Um, compared to the same period last year, the amount of U.S. government tax refunds has declined, and that's mainly due to the decline in taxpayer income compared to the same period last year, which is interesting. In a, um, but he gives, as the amount of tax due decreases, uh, so does obviously tax refunds. Uh, revolving consumer debt, uh, which is essentially like credit card use, um, is at an all-time high. Uh, media analysis indicates that the U.S. households may be uh, overwhelmed by debt. Um, and, yeah, we'll see how that goes. Again, I was just saying, like, people with the, with the uh, 
<laughs> anecdote I was saying at the beginning of the show, um, people buying old cars for long-term loans and high rates, it's, it's, and you know, there's nothing, that's what you have to do. That's what you have to do. Everyone has to do that now. Um, at least you're common American. And it's just, it'll be crazy to see what happens with that. Uh, the student loan repayment uh, moratorium ends in the second quarter, which is, again, another big thing uh, we should be planning around, uh, meaning 450, uh, 45 million people will begin repaying their loans. Um, now, you know, all this kind of being at the confluence of, of major economic tightening um, will be something to behold. Um, it really, you know, will be interesting. I didn't get to go over... Um, the National Bureau of Economic uh, Research paper. Uh, it's super interesting though, it's talking about the tax evasion of the top US income distribution, uh, which really falls in again with what the French authorities were trying to find out. I'm gonna link that in the den if you're not in it. Get in the den, folks. Have a great rest of your day and uh, we will see you tomorrow.